Amen. Can we pray right now? Amen. Father, we bless you for the moment and the time that we're in. It's an awesome time, God. Even we keep our eyes upon you. We keep our eyes upon Jesus. Amen. Because everything else is, is wavering. But God, we keep our eyes on you. We won't be tossed by the winds and the waves, and God, because our eyes are set upon what you're calling, what you want us to do for such a time as this, why we are here, why you placed us here for this time in this dispensation when everything seems to be chaotic. God, you that common voice, you that common, you that peace in the middle of the storm. And so, God, we thank you for that right now in Jesus' name. As we set our eyes upon you, um, nothing else matters at the moment. And we give you glory and we give you honor. In the master's name of Jesus, we do pray. And the church said, Amen. 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 We're going to call Reverend Doughty to uh, introduce our speaker. Amen. 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 It's my privilege and my duty to introduce our next speaker. This is my sister in Christ. She keeps me honest, she keeps me straight sometimes. And she tells me sometimes things I don't want to hear. That's the truth, sister. But it's always the truth and it's always for my benefit. So she's a teacher, she's a woman of God. She's a person that you can trust. Someone that you have a problem you can come to. And don't worry about it. If you expect help, you're going to get help. I'd like to introduce to some and present to others Cheryl. our focus on one another. We are the church and as such need to continue to remain in unity. Does this sound familiar? Unity is my title for today. Look at this message as a continuance of my last message because we're not done. We ain't finished. Ephesians 4, verse 1. As a prisoner for the Lord, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Yes. Yeah. Be completely humble and gentle. All right. yeah. Be patient. Bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. Yeah. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this congregation. Thank you for the saints who are gathered here today. Thank yeah. you for Mount Moriah Christian Church and its viability and, and strength in life to last these 40 plus years, Heavenly Father. We know, Lord, that it will go on for many, many more with you at the helm and with unity in the body. In your righteous and holy name I pray, amen. Amen. God's desire for the church is perfect unity. Yes. Jesus prayed that the church may be one, and for this reason, much of the Spirit's internal work has the purpose of producing unity in the church. Yes. So how do we define unity? The state of being united or joined as a whole. Being together or at one with someone or something. It's the opposite of divided, amen? amen? Unity can be described negatively as a lack of division, or it can be described positively 
as having commonality in our thoughts, our desires, affections, pursuits, and consequently in our actions. Unity is hard to come by in this world. Worldly unity is artificial. It's fragile. Worldly unity does not last. Unity in the world is when people see it in their best interest to lay aside differences. Well, if this works for me, I guess I'll do it. Not about other people, not about upholding others, but whatever works for them. Spiritual unity is not this way. There's a difference between the world's spirit of unity and the church's unity of the spirit. The focus of a spirit of unity is for unity's sake and it results in compromise. The unity of the spirit is purposeful, spirit-led, spirit-empowered. Unity under the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Spiritual unity keeps the Spirit of God as its center. And as Reverend told us earlier today, we have to keep our eyes on Christ. All that we are and all that we do must please the Spirit of God. Amen? Amen. Spiritual unity doesn't come about by organization or by pressure. It's not driven by self-interest. Spiritual unity is produced by the inward work of the Holy Spirit. Yes. The Holy Spirit that motivates us to please our Lord Jesus Christ. Acts 1.14 is, is an example of the early church's unity. They all joined together constantly in prayer, yes. along with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. Acts 4.32 tells us all the believers were one in heart and mind. And then verse 33 tells us that the spiritual fruit of grace was produced by this unity. Yes. Acts 4.33, with great power the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of Jesus Christ and much grace was upon them all. After the death of Christ, the disciples were initially distraught. They didn't understand God's redemptive faith. The disciples on the road to Emesis were sad. Uh, Peter returned to fishing. Thomas died at the resurrection. That right there was an open door for division. But it didn't happen. After his resurrection, Jesus appeared to the disciples and gave them a unified mission. Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And then he told them to meet together in Jerusalem. They were unified in their obedience to Christ. The disciples in obedience to Christ met together and continued on one accord in prayer and supplication. As a provision, God sent the Holy Spirit. The outpouring of the Holy Spirit is an act of the Father in answer to the prayer of Christ. John 17, 20, and 23, my prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who believe in me through their message that all of them may become one. Father, just as you are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory. I have given them the glory that you gave me that they might be as one as we are one. I in them and you in me. May they be brought to complete unity to let the world know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. And Reverend Witherspoon talked about the glory of God that is now present in us. Amen? Amen. The Holy Spirit is the glory 
that God the Father has given us and the means by which all believers are united in Him. We are one because we share the nature of Christ. For all of us who were baptized into Christ have clothed ourselves with Christ. We walk in Christ. We are Christ. We emulate everything that who Christ was. And for this reason, the church is referred to as the body of Christ. All believers share the same Lord, the same faith, the same God, the same calling, and are part of the same body and have been baptized by the same Spirit. Our baptism in the body of Christ speaks of our spiritual unity. This unity is what every church must work to achieve. Yes. We're not done, folks. That's right. That's right. We're just beginning. That's right. That's right. But it doesn't end there. Because unity comes through maturity. Right. Right. And I know I've stood up here and said this before many a times. Well, what does spiritual maturity look like? How does one become mature? Maturity is preparing God's people for works of service. So that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God. And become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Unity in the church is produced when Christians grow in faith. This growth means increasing in the knowledge of Christ. Mm -hmm. Increasing in the knowledge of Christ. Yeah. Not just mind knowledge, but heart knowledge as well. That's right. And becoming stable in our doctrine. What do we believe? That's right. That's right. That's right. What do we stand for as a church? Uh -huh. As a unified body of Christ? Right. When we all seek to please the same Lord, Studying and obeying the same Bible, yeah. adhering to the same doctrine, right. we will naturally be unified. Right. Church unity is the product of Christians growing in the Lord and walking in the Spirit. Yes. Yes. As a Christian matures, they grow in love, they grow in joy, peace, long-suffering, and gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, and these are the fruit or the evidence of the Spirit's working. This spiritual fruit is developed in each and every growing Christian, and it leads to new and exciting areas of unity. The Jesus in me will not clash with the Jesus in you. Everybody stand up, because we're about to do something right now. You all know this song, don't you? And we're going to sing it to one another and sing it to our neighbor. And we're going to sing it loud because we are unified. Amen. Amen. The Jesus in me loves the Jesus in you. The Jesus in me makes the Jesus in you so easy.
debating for areas of common interest. We're not strangers trying to get along. We're brothers and sisters in Christ, amen? With the exact same spirit working to make us all like Jesus Christ. Our love for our Lord and Savior and the transforming power of the Spirit of God is what produces the ability for us to walk in supernatural unity, amen? A growing church is a unified church. Has your spiritual growth helped you be more unified with your brothers and sisters in Christ? I hope so. That's a question I want you to carry with you for the rest of this week. How has your spiritual growth united you with your brothers and sisters in Christ? How has your spiritual growth matured you with your brothers and sisters in Christ? So, unity is twofold. It involves God's sovereignty, but it also is our responsibility. We, we, we have something to do with this. On one hand, there's God's provision of the Holy Spirit as the source of our unity. And on the other hand, there's our responsibility to keep unity using diligence, labor, and effort. In other words, unity takes work. It's easy to love. Unity takes work. Philippians. Second chapter, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any fellowship with the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and purpose. The encouragement and comfort that we have in Christ the fellowship we have with the Spirit and the mercies or tenderness and compassion that God has shown us should create in us a spirit of gratitude, a spirit of indebtedness, and obedience. That's a hard one for some. We didn't do too well minding our mom and dad. And, and we want our children to be obedient. But oftentimes, when it comes to us being obedient to the one and only, what happens? What are the spiritual attitudes that maintain unity in the church? Well, I'm glad you asked. Humility. Humility is an essential character quality that should define every single one of us. Humility involves considering others, as we heard earlier, as superior to ourselves. Meekness. These words are not foreign to any of you who are in Christ. Amen? Meekness is a humble attitude that expresses itself in the patient endurance of offenses. Mm. Offenses. Someone made me mad. I didn't like the way they said that. You know, the Lord has ordained these uh, messages because we, we got a repeat here, amen? amen? The Lord is working with us and amongst us to make sure that we all hear and know the word it is that he would have us to get. Yes. The word that he would have us to carry with us. Yes. A meek person does not always have to be right. That's right. All right. That's right. A meek person doesn't engage in arguments that cause strife. Woo! A meek person doesn't react harshly. What? <laughs> and has learned how to maintain unity. Mm. And has learned how to maintain unity by putting down pride and making peace the priority. It takes two to argue. 
if you respond to negativity or coarseness or harshness with meekness, gentleness, and humility, it'll have the same effect as throwing water on the fire. Because you rob that person of the fuel that they need to fan their anger into wrath and bitterness. Because all they want is for you to come back. All they want is for you to say, what? All they want is for you to like, you know, face up to them. It's like the kids at school, it's like, what? And they just want somebody to come back. And when you look at them like, Okay. <laughs> I'm afraid for you. Long suffering. Long suffering. Long suffering speaks of being long tempered. That means you got to take it for a while. And we talked about that the gold and the fire has to go through some serious heat. We as Christians sometimes have to go through some serious heat. Long temper. Yes. Patient. Oh my gosh. You want me to have patience? This is an instant world. When microwaves first came out, my kids went to my mom and said, My mom don't cook no more. <laughs> Everything went in the microwave. Instant, instant, instant. Having endurance through negative circumstances, especially when dealing with others. Yes. Long suffering. Long temper. <coughs> patience. Endurance through negative circumstances. I can't say this slow enough. Forbearance. Forbearance is even more intense than long-suffering. It literally means to put up with one another. Excuse me. I got to put up with her. And him. And you. kidding me? Forbearance is loving in the midst of others' imperfections. In the midst of others' faults. In the midst of others' annoyances. And even when it is taxing on us. And can I get an amen from the married people in the house? Yes. Because it's always their fault. He didn't do this. He didn't do that. But this is pointing out the imperfections of others. The faults of others. The annoyances of others. Not pointing those fingers. But don't, baby, don't, don't, don't take over. He's pointing back at me. Don't try to do my sermon. <laughs> Not looking at our own imperfections, our own faults, our own annoyances that without fail are sure to tax someone else. That's good. It goes both ways. Last but not least, all of the above must be done in the context of love and the desire to maintain peace. As my brother said earlier this morning, God is among us. Amen. God hates discord in the church. He has provided us with everything we need to maintain oneness, to maintain unity. We must always labor to keep unity in the church. This means being in a continual state of growth, exhibiting Christ-like qualities, and employing the tools of unity 
which God has left us. Yes. When a church functions this way, it can, with one heart and mouth, glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Yes. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you once again for this opportunity. We know, Heavenly Father, that you have predestined us to be one. You have predestined us to fellowship together. You have predestined us to work together and pray together and just to be one in you. So the more we walk like you and think like you and live like you, the more we will be one. And I'm asking, Heavenly Father, that everyone will leave here today with that sense of oneness with you so that we can be one with another. In your righteous and holy name I pray. Amen. 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 There may be someone here who doesn't know our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. There may be someone who is looking for a church home. If you are, Mount Moriah welcomes you. We are a family. Yes. And we're growing. Yes. Our roots are deep. And we can continue to grow as those new leaves sprout up at the top. Amen? Amen. As those new leaves sprout out, we can't forget those roots That's right. That's right. that brought us to where we are today. Is there anyone here that wants to know the God I serve, oh the Lord Jesus Christ, who saved every single one of us <coughs> with his blood on the cross. <coughs> is there anyone here who is looking for a church home, a group of people to call family? Yes, right. We're brothers and sisters <coughs> in Christ. Yes. No matter how mad I get, no matter how upset I get, I'm still your brother and sister in Christ, and you're still my brother and sister in Christ. Nothing is going to take that away. Just like he said earlier, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Nobody's going to take away the fact that you're my sister. They can say what they want. They can talk about us. They can do whatever they want. It's not going to change anything. We're that family. We're the ones who follow Jesus Christ. Walk in his will and walk in his way. Is there anyone here who wants prayer? Is there anyone here who is struggling right now and uh, needs a word of prayer from our ministers or anything of that nature? We know, Heavenly Father, there's struggles everywhere. Everywhere. This is my niece, Carlene. I want to pray about um, finding the truth in what I'm looking for and not being um, sad about it and the strength to be stronger. She just said I could share. My niece here is looking for personal strength. My niece here is tired of allowing someone else to control her life. My niece here is reaching out to her Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who she knows, who she grew up, grew up with. She knows the Lord. She knows where her strength comes from. But every now and then, it's kind of easy to slip back into the old thing, slip back into what we used to do, slip back into who we used to do, amen? And so it's time for my niece right now, Heavenly Father, right now, to come to who she is in Christ. Can I have the ministers come up, please, and gather around her? She needs all of our strength. She needs all of our love. Because that is what is going to keep her going, keep her moving, keep her going forward, keep her from falling. Come on, demons, we all in this together. So lay your hands on my knees right here, right now.
Father, we thank you. We praise your name because we know there's none like you, Lord. And even as we come standing in the gap right now for your child, you know her better than she knows herself. You know her better than anything on this earth that have tried to control her, God. We lift her up to you right now, Lord. As she comes, Lord, courageously coming before the church, asking for prayer, God. You said that if we call, you would answer and show great and unsearchable things that we don't know. She doesn't know which way to go unless you lead her, God. We pray that you lead her, Lord, into a place where she can find her purpose in you. But she can understand that it's about you, God. It's not about what's going on in this world, but it's about you because you keep drawing her back to you, God. You keep bringing her back, Lord. You surround her with people that love her, God. You surround her with people that love you and want her to be able to see you as her strength and as the one that she will trust, not this world, but you, God. We ask you, Lord, to touch this young woman, Lord. Touch her because the world is an evil, Lord, God. And we know that they have no good thing for her. But you said you have all good things, God. And it's all good in you, Lord. As you pour your love out on her, Lord. Teach her, Lord. Teach her to lead and depend on you. Because there's no one else in this world that can love her like you, Lord God. Can nobody hold her like you, Lord Jesus. You just move in her right now, Lord, and teach her. Teach her to lay at your feet for herself, God. And to call on you in the mighty and powerful name of Jesus. Father, continue to unite us as a body of Christ so that we can move forward and the leaves, the brand new leaves on that tree will start to bud to show the new growth with the foundation of the roots. In your righteous and holy name I pray. Amen. 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 If anyone has an offering, please stop by Sister Susie at the door. She will take your offering, your benevolence. Thank you. 